So we have we we saw how hydrophobic signaling molecules move. We saw very schematically we saw how, how nitric oxide and carbon monoxide are generated, and uh, very very briefly we saw that how they activate. Now coming to neurotransmitters, this is a very vital category of signaling molecules. Coming to the action of uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, as I said, they carry signals between neurons or from neurons to other type of target cells, such as muscle cells. Now, they are a group of small hydrophilic molecules. Mind it, these are hydrophilic molecules, that is water loving, or otherwise, they, that means they are lipophobic, that is, they cannot diffuse through lipid bilayer. So, these are hydrophilic molecules. Uh, neurotransmitters, these are hydrophilic molecules that include acetylcholine, dopamine, epinephrine, serotonin, histamine, then GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid and many more. So these are some examples. This is acetylcholine and this is GABA. This is the structure of another important signaling molecule, auxine, but we'll come to it later on. We are now restricting ourselves to neurotransmitters. So when we think about neurotransmitters, so neurotransmitters, as you can see, if I, if I, if, uh, I enlarge this portion of the slide, so this is a synaptic junction. Neurotransmitters fall under the paracrine category mainly. The neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic membrane and they are taken up by receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So, Mostly, this is how the neurotransmitters move. This is a much simplified model of the movement of neurotransmitters. As you can see, there is A, B, C, C prime, A prime, B prime. There are so many cells. So neurotransmitters are released and, and accordingly, the receptors for the neurotransmitters are upregulated by the target cell and the neurotransmitters are taken in. As I was saying a bit earlier, that nervous system also have, uh, I mean, so the signals in a nervous system also move through electrical stimuli. So I was talking about gap junctions. Second semester, you'll be studying gap junctions in the plasma membrane portion. So the, in case of gap junctions, as you can see, the ions move through gap junctions. Neurotransmitters do not move through gap junctions. So neurotransmitters actually move via this pathway as it has been shown, shown here. Now, once the neurotransmitters, this is not about that, or once the neurotransmitters are activated or taken up by receptors, in most cases, they activate a category of protein known as G protein. So the neurotransmitters are taken up by receptors, which usually have a small molecule of protein attached at its cytoplasmic end. So if a neurotransmitter is taken up by a receptor, there is a small protein known as G protein. We'll be briefly studying G protein later on. A small G protein remains attached to the cytoplasmic surface. Since the G protein remains attached to these receptors at the cytoplasmic surface, these receptors are also known as GPCR, G protein coupled receptors. It is by the action of the G proteins that the neurotransmitters further initiate the downstream signaling pathway in the target cell. So for now, let us concentrate. Since I was talking about these small molecules known as neurotransmitters, these neurotransmitters follow the paracrine category of signaling mode and they are released by a neighboring uh, they are released by a presynaptic member by a cell by a presynaptic cell and is taken by the receptors of a postsynaptic cell so this is how basically the neurotransmitters move now coming to hormones one important category of hormones are the peptide hormones and growth factors so if we again go back to the signaling molecule slide so we had peptide hormones and growth factors now, peptide hormones and growth factors 
use a number of pathways and a number of downstream signaling mechanisms. So I'm moving on to this picture. So this is the basic mechanism of action of peptide hormones and the growth factors. As you can see that usually in case of peptide hormones, they are lipophobic. That is, they cannot diffuse through the plasma membrane. And the picture itself is really very clear that the hormone is received by a receptor. See, there are two variety of receptors. This is one category of receptor. This is another category of receptor. So the receptors might vary. And if you can see, once the receptor is, receives the hormone, then the signal is then further carried on by this alpha, beta, gamma, as you can see, this is nothing but a G protein. It's made up of three units, alpha, beta, and gamma. So in the first case, you saw that the hormone binds with the receptor and the G protein is activated. While in the second case also, the receptor structure is different, but the hormone binds with the receptor and the G protein is activated. So in this case also, and in this case, we are getting that the G protein is being activated for the case. Now downstream, the third enzyme, so the receptor, the hormone binds with the receptor, activation of G protein, hormone binds with receptor, activation of G protein. Thereafter, the signaling molecules can differ depending upon the cellular need, depending upon the cellular microenvironment. One path can involve um, another molecule known as adenylcyclase. Uh, another path can involve a molecule known as phospholipase C. Whatever the pathways involved, ultimately we get a cellular response. So in case of peptide hormones and growth factors, peptide hormones includes neuropeptides, it includes insulin, glucagon, it includes hormones produced by the pituitary gland like the growth hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, prolactin. It also includes the neuropeptides such as the endorphins. And uh, the growth factors also involve the nerve growth factors. So this, this host of molecules choose this kind of receptor signaling pathway. The receptor might involve different signaling molecules in the pathway, but the basic mechanism is there is a receptor which binds with the stimuli to be, to be activated, resulting in downstream activation pathways. The pathways of activation, downstream activation might differ. So this is how this was our, our fourth category, peptide hormones and growth factors. Now coming to another important signaling molecule known as icosanoids. Now let's look into the structure of icosanoids. Here you can look in the structure. This is a membrane phospholipids. In case of icosanoids, I should point out here that Several types of lipids serve as signaling molecules by binding to cell surface receptor. The most important molecules are the members of the lipids which behave as signaling molecules are known as icosanoids, which include, so icos, icosanoids are a group of lipid molecules behaving as stimuli, and includes prostaglandins. I think so second semester you somewhere, somehow you might have heard the word prostaglandins, prostacyclines, thrombexins, and leukotrienes. They act very locally and they are broken down also very easily and very rapid. They act locally either by the uh, autocrine or the paracrine pathway and their action is very rapid. And when the breakdown occurs, the breakdown is also very rapid. So you can see this is a lipid membrane phospholipid. The membrane phospholipids gives rise to a molecule known as arachidonic acid, AA, which is then converted to either prostaglandins, prostacyclines, thombrexone, 
here the structure of prostaglandin is shown or by another pathway to leukotrienes there are two basic pathways shown here one is known as the cyclooxygenase pathway and another lipooxygenase pathway for second semester you do not need to get into the details of the pathway no need just remember that certain lipid molecules helps in signaling they act as stimuli members of these lipid molecules are known as eicosanoids they can be of these variety types and this is a very very schematic representation i just wanted to show you how the signaling is done you don't in your syllabus you don't have to get into details of the signaling pathway you can see so this is arachidonic acid see this was a membrane phospholipid this is arachidonic acid which is the precursor molecule from which eicosanoids are synthesized just like arginine behaves as a precursor molecule from which nitric oxide can be synthesized by enzymatic reaction similarly arachidonic acid is a precursor molecule from which eicosanoids can be synthesized by enzymatic reaction so this is arachidonic acid and these are the two pathways the green pathway the green i mean to say the green color pathway is the pathway for prostaglandin so arachidonic acid the arachidonic acid is converted to prostaglandin and then the signaling pathways the signaling molecule pathway that it involves is the cyclic adenosine monophosphate pathway or the inositol p3 and dag pathway so the prostaglandins follow this pathway for second semester this words are new we'll be getting into the details of this pathways later on right now since i'm dealing with the signaling molecules i'm saying this names we'll later on relate these names to the pathways when we study so if the arachidonic acid is converted to prostaglandins they follow the signaling pathway of cyclic adenosine monophosphate or inositol phosphate 3 and diacylglycerol pathway and the g as you can see here gs and gq these are variants of the g protein so both the pathways involves the g protein complex if i look into the yellow color region the yellow color region is the another category of eicosanoids that is a leukotrienes so the leukotrienes follow this pathway where the signaling is mediated by the inositol phosphate 3 and the diacyl acyl glycerol and another variant of g protein is used here the gq so as a whole when lipid molecules helps in signaling the group of lipid molecules and can be clustered together under a big name known as eicosanoids the eicosanoids have the precursor arachidonic acid from which two category of eicosanoids can be produced one category follow the green signaling pathway and the other category follow the yellow signaling pathway so this was about eicosanoids and the last signaling molecule we will be studying are the plant hormones since we are not going much into details of plant hormones we all know that there are a host of there are variety of plant hormones each plant hormone is specific to a certain stimuli i have shown you a very schematic representation of one hormone which we have all studied during 11 and 12 that is the auxin so this is the auxin signaling pathway you can see that even there is no auxin this molecule is known as auxin response factor present in the cytoplasm and at times it can translocate to the nucleoplasm if you look into this auxin response factor it has two parts it has a blue part that is the main auxin response factor to which a yellow ball is attached this is known as ox or 1 aa which is the inhibitor for the auxin response factor whenever there is auxin present auxin is diffuses through the cell auxin diffuses through the cell to be accepted by the auxin receptor protein and auxin is binds with this auxin receptor protein it it uh, it is partially activated it then can bind with the ox or the 1 aa and causes the 
degradation of the inhibitor. See, the inhibitor was preventing the blue one from gene transcription. So what does auxin actually do? Auxin binds with the inhibitor. The auxin receptor complex binds with the inhibitor, degrading the inhibitor by the ubiquitylation pathway. I had very briefly talked about the ubiquitylation pathway in my cell cycle class. So it's the same pathway they follow. And in the process of degrading the inhibitor, what do we get? We get the auxin response factor active. It is now capable of uh, sitting on the promoter region of the target genes and thereby carrying on transcription of the target genes. So with this, we come to the end of the various category of signaling molecules and how these various signaling molecules work in the cell or the pathways these signaling molecules follow inside the cell. So these were the various categories of signaling molecules. So with the completion of the signaling molecules, now we move on to the signaling receptors. The receptors can be at the very outset categorized into two basic types, the cell surface receptor and the intracellular receptors. As you can see, for the cell surface receptors, most signaling molecules in this case, the red one is a signaling molecule. For a cell surface receptor, most signaling molecules are hydrophilic, that is they are water loving or lipophobic, lipid fearing. So for such molecules who will not be able to diffuse through the plasma membrane, they bind to these extracellular receptors and in turn generate, generate, sorry, and in turn generate signals in the cytoplasmic end. Because these signaling molecules cannot pass through the plasma membrane, they are very receptor specific. They bind to the receptor and they activate the cytoplasmic region of the receptor. And from the cytoplasmic region of the receptor, the signal then moves downstream through the cytoplasm and to finally to the nucleoplasm and the DNA. However, as I have showed you the structure of certain hydrophilic hormones, uh, sorry, hydrophilic, no, lipophilic hormones. I had shown you the function of certain lipophilic hormones. So certain receptors are intracellular. That means some molecules which are lipophilic in nature or hydrophobic, that is they are water fearing and lipid loving. These molecules can easily pass through the lipid bilayer. Since these molecules can easily pass through the lipid bilayer, these molecules can pass through, diffuse through the lipid bilayer into the cytoplasm. Now, when they are in the cytoplasm, two kinds of intracellular receptor might be there. One category is the nuclear receptor. The other category is the cytoplasmic receptor. So when a lipophilic molecule moves into the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm, it has a choice. It can bind with the cytoplasmic receptor or it can directly enter into the nucleoplasm to bind with the nuclear receptor. And thereafter, as I had stated earlier, it can then, uh, um, on binding with the receptor, a conformational change of the receptor occurs. And this receptor is now capable of binding to the, interacting with the DNA directly. So at the very outset, we are now thorough that there are two basic kinds of receptors. The first category are the extracellular receptors. Here the signaling molecules are hydrophilic, but the second category are the intracellular receptors. Here the signaling molecules can diffuse across the plasma membrane and bind to the receptor pro uh, proteins present inside the target cell, either in the cytosol or in the nucleoplasm. Sorry, nucle uh, nucleus. So these are the two basic category of receptors that can be found. Now I'm moving on to this picture is from Leninger, one of my most favorite book and I consider it to be a Bible for molecular biology from the biochemistry aspect. And I always suggest, usually I suggest it in my class. I don't remember if I've suggested it to second semester, 
but right now I'm suggesting it online that if you can read Leninger from page one to last page thoroughly, later on, you all know that to, you have to sit for national eligibility test to get through Police Service Commission or to get through uh, scientific uh, pathways. So this book, if you are able to read this book in the tenure of three years of BSc and two years of MSc, then net will be a cakewalk for you. It's one who reads Leninger thoroughly. I haven't seen a single student who uh, have thoroughly read Leninger and have not got through net. So I just love this book. So this picture is of Leninger. Now, as per this book, there are six kinds of receptors. The previous picture was from Bruce Alberts, where I had given the blue, where Alberts has have given us a very broad classification of what are the different categories of receptors. Cell surface and intracellular. This picture actually now further categorizes the receptor a bit more stringently. So there are certain receptors known as G protein coupled receptor, G, P, C, R. Next is the RTK, receptor tyrosine kinase. Third is the RGC, receptor guanyl cyclase. These two receptors are a bit different from G protein, these are known as enzyme coupled receptors. That means the receptors have enzymatic activity on their cytoplasmic surface. This is another category of membrane channels. They recognize only ions. They do not recognize anything else except for ions. So they are known as gated ion channel. Then we have adhesion receptors. Uh, and I do not know if second semester have uh, studied the extra cytoskeletal structure. If you have studied, then you must have heard about the name integrin. So this is a molecule found in the extracellular matrix. So this um, uh, the cell uh, this receptors helps in cellular response with reference to the extracellular matrix. And there is another kind of receptor which we studied. Mm, earlier as a nuclear receptor uh, where I had said that hormones might directly diffuse into the cytoplasm and based on choice can bind with a cytoplasmic receptor or a nuclear receptor. Now coming to it one by one. So GPCR, if we look into these receptors, the speciality of these receptors is that these receptors have a protein molecule known as G protein bound to their surface. If you remember the previous picture where there was a so they have this G protein bound to their surface, sorry, cytoplasmic end. And when this G protein has three subunits, as you can see, alpha, beta, gamma. Whenever there is a signaling molecule, it binds with the receptor and activates this G protein. So at the cytoplasmic end, if there is a receptor ligand binding here, at the cytoplasmic end, the receptor is activated and the alpha beta gamma complex is activated and alpha, the, and the G protein is activated. And once the G protein is activated, alpha moves away from this complex to activate a further enzyme. So mind it, here what we see here that in the so this was our first messenger the ligand is the, bearing the first message the message moves on to g protein and from the g protein the message moves on to an enzyme okay so it might also happen that from the g protein the message moves on to another kind of enzyme the enzyme differs so these are G, gpcr or g protein coupled receptors as you can see once the receptor is activated the ligand receptor binding is occurring and once the ligand receptor binding is occurring the g protein is activated and the whole g protein doesn't move the alpha subunit moves to activate an enzyme which can be either adenylate cyclase as i showed in the picture or it can be phospholipase whatever might be the enzyme 
and the pathway starts. So this was G protein couple receptors. Now let us move on to receptor tyrosine kinases. You can see there are written 2A, 2B. Okay. What happens is that the ligand by, see, these are known as enzyme coupled receptors. Why enzyme coupled? The enzyme links, not coupled. I, I use the terminology wrong. These are known as enzyme linked receptors. Why enzyme linked? Because at the base of the uh, receptor, if you can see, at the base of the receptor, in case of the enzyme link receptors, as you can see on the cytoplasmic surface of the receptor, there are certain areas or regions which behaves as enzymes. Or it might recruit certain enzymes from the cytoplasm. So the moment the ligand binds with the receptor, you can see the cytoplasmic end of the receptors become attracted towards each other and phosphorylation of these regions occur. And once they are phosphorylated, the kinase cascade start. If you remember, while teaching cell cycle, I had said that there are two molecular switches. One was the kinase phosphatase switch, where I had said that one substrate can be activated by addition of phosphates. So kinase is an enzyme that usually activates its substrate by addition of phosphates. And phosphatase is the other enzyme which actually deactivates its substrate by removing the phosphate. So as you can see, when we use the word receptor tyrosine kinase, it is evident that there is a phosphorylation phenomena occurring in these receptors and which amino acid is being phosphorylated? The tyrosine. So this is the receptor tyrosine kinase. And the second part is 2B. Once the kinase cascade starts, the kinase activates transcription factor resulting in gene transcription. The third category is the receptor guanine cyclase. Here also, if you can see, the receptor binds to its stimuli or the ligand and the cytoplasmic surface of the receptor can remain attached to a GTP, guanyl triphosphate. And once the ligand receptor activation has occurred, the GTP is converted to cyclin guanosine guanosine monophosphate. And uh, again, an enzyme cascade has started. However, don't get confused between GTP and G protein. These are two different things. GTP is an energy currency, so it's also an energy currency, guanosine, guanosine triphosphate. G protein is a complex of three subunits, alpha, beta, gamma. These are two different molecules. Next coming to four, gated ion channels. Here, the channels remain closed. Once the ion moves on to the channel, the channel opens. So we have the sodium potassium ion channels. We have a lot of ion channels in our, in fact, the nervous system, the rapid movement of new uh, impulse through the nervous, nervous system is carried forward by the sodium potassium channels. So that is ion channel. As I said, the specifically they recognize ions. Next coming to adhesion receptors. As I said, these receptors can bind molecules in the extracellular matrix receive the information from the extracellular matrix and then can accordingly modulate their internal cytoskeletal network. And finally, the nuclear receptors. The nuclear receptors are important in the sense that the nuclear receptors, they act very fast because in this case, small stimuli molecules can pass on, small stimuli molecules can directly diffuse into the cytoplasm through the cytoplasm into the nucleus, bind with the nuclear receptor, and then these uh, changed receptors now can directly bind or interact with the DNA. So these nuclear receptors act very fast. So this is the 
a very brief schematic about the different types of receptors that are seen in our cells. I'll show you pictures of another book, which is a very simplified book. Uh, this is a book of, from Physio of Physiology by Sulte. And you can see, so these are the ones we have just dis discussed, ligand gated channel receptor, G protein coupled, and intracellular receptor. This picture is from Pollard. And here Pollard has described the existence of 16 category of receptors. I've given this picture to show you that Leninger actually uh, divided the receptor family into six categories. So he, what to say, concised the picture, but Pollard gave a very elaborate picture of the number of receptors that can be found in variety of cells. And that is why I've shown this picture. These receptors, as you can see, uh, a lot of them work in the same pathway. For example, if this category of receptors, there are four receptors belonging here, they all act by the tyrus RTK pathway, as you can see. These two, they are ion channels. Now, we have a G protein receptor. This is the seven helix G protein receptor. These are Integrin, cadherin, and selectin, these two belong to the, I mean to say, the adhesion molecule receptors. So he further elaborated the receptors, which was uh, shown by Leninger in the concise six family of receptors. So this is much of a detailed picture of the different category of receptors that are observed. And today we will end our class here. Tomorrow we'll start with the signaling through the receptors.